Um, good morning and welcome to the 18th meeting in 2017 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. As normal, please put your mobile phones on silent. Um, the first item on our agenda today is to take evidence on the applicability of legislative consent in respect of Brexit from Professor Alan Page of the University of Dundee, Professor Stephen Tierney of the University of Edinburgh. Uh, I warmly welcome both of the witnesses to the meeting. Members have received some very interesting papers from, from you both. Um, I'm sure we've all had a chance to digest these. So we'll just get straight into the questions, because you've obviously given us considerable food for thought. And Adam Tonkins will kick the show off. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, good morning. Um, I, I want to ask you uh, um, about the SEAL Convention and about the <coughs> um, uh, extent to which, if at all, um, you think that the SEAL Convention um, uh, um, applies to the making of secondary legislation, um, and whether you can provide any authority, legal, political, or constitutional, <laughs> um, and others will ask you about what those words mean, um, uh, for the answer, what you think the answer to that question might be. Okay. Um, well, thank you for the question, uh, the unexpected starting point. Uh, my, my short answer would be to the effect that it doesn't apply uh, and, I, and since you specifically asked for authority for that proposition, uh, you know, I would say that, um, as I've said in my written submission, it's a, it's a rule that's pretty clearly set out. It's been set out unambiguously uh, ever since devolution began, and there has been absolutely no mention of it or its application in relation to subordinate um, secondary legislation. Um, to which I might add a point that I actually made in my paper that the Scottish Government in its submission to the Smith Commission argued for the extension of the, of the Convention to secondary legislation in the devolved areas, which might be taken as an acknowledgement uh, of the fact that um, it doesn't apply. And if I was to go further uh, and take the example which has been of most concern to me, uh, that is to say, the, the exercise of concurrent powers and the transposition of EU obligations. There has, the Scottish Parliament's consent has never been sought in relation to that. Um, worse, I would say, the Scottish Parliament remains singularly un uninformed or ill-informed about the extent to which that is actually happening. So I, 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 I regard it as an area where the Convention just simply doesn't apply, which is not to say it shouldn't, but... Um, at the moment, I think it doesn't. Thank you. Steve, I would agree with that. I'd say the accepted <coughs> understanding is that the Seal Convention does not apply to secondary legislation. Um, and obviously, in the context we're looking at, the Great Repeal Bill, that does raise considerable issues and, and a, a real lacuna in terms of how the powers that will be accorded to the executive under the Great Repeal Bill then play out um, and what level of consent will be sought or um, could be sought from the devolved legislatures. Thank you. Can I, can I move then to the question of whether you think the Seoul Convention should apply um, to um, secondary legislation? Um, Jennings uh, in the 1930s said that when we are um, uh, uh, trying to understand the scope of a convention, um, and the Seoul Convention is a constitutional convention, um, which is to say it's a binding rule of constitutional behaviour which is not judicially enforceable. Um, uh, when we look to see what the scope of a constitutional convention is, we should look um, to see what the purpose um, of the convention is. So what is the, whether there's a good rule for it, whether there's a good reason for it. What is the purpose of limiting the application of the SEAL convention to primary legislation and not extending it to delegated legislation? I think the short answer is that that was the context in which it was first thought about, and the question of its application to secondary legislation was never thought about, never actually addressed. But uh, as you hint in your in your question, if you think about it in terms of principle or underlying principle or purpose, namely that the consent of the devolved legislature should be obtained to changes um, which bear upon its responsibilities, then uh, I, I would have said that. Um, it's unarguable that the Convention should apply uh, to changes regardless of the form, if you like, in which they're made, whether they're made by primary or by secondary legislation. 
So this is a gap, as I see it, and a gap which, as Stephen has just said, will become not only more apparent but more pressing uh, in the context of Brexit. Yeah, I, I would agree that the, the purpose that one imagines of Sewell not being applied is, is largely a practical one. Se there's much more secondary legislation than primary legislation, <clears throat> and it would become in practical terms extremely difficult for consent to be sought every time a piece of secondary legislation has to be made. Secondly, secondary legislation tends to be on less important, more technical matters, and again, it would be possibly taking a sledgehammer to crack a nut to seek formal consent every time there was some minor technical matter that required to be made by the executive. <clears throat> but and I'm delighted to hear Jennings quoted in the, in the, in the Parliament. But the, the fundamental point is that this is a constitutional issue of principle. And conventions are rules. And those rules are there to, to help regulate behaviour. We have a constitution. We have constitutional rules to regulate, largely to regulate the executive. And insofar as this convention operates to regulate the executive in the context we are now looking at, we are talking about secondary legislation that will be made in great volume and concerned with matters that are not simply technical, that will be concerned with major substantive issues in the repeal of a vast body of European legislation on areas covering things from workers' rights to environmental issues and so on. So it would seem to me that if we look behind the technicality of so not applying to secondary legislation, we are left with the gap of principle that Alan is alluding to, whereby there's a, there is a possibility that the devolved legislatures may not be involved in making very fundamental decisions about the removal of very important areas of law. Final question from me on this. Um, um, it, a supplementary comment on what I said, um, unless this is the subject of your question, but the question then becomes one of, granted that this is a gap, how do you fill it? Um, and what I w was going to say, or <coughs> could have added earlier to my earlier answer in relation to that, I think the an you don't fill it by extending the Sewell Convention to secondary legislation. There are other ways in which you can tackle that question by con consultation consent requirements, which I think would be um, I think, I, I think others want to ask you about that, and I won't jump in but, uh, on that. But the final question I wanted to ask about this was, given that you've identified a gap um, uh, and is there any way, in your view, given the judgment of the Supreme Court in Miller, that that gap could be challenged or filled through judicial action? Or has the judgment in Miller completely ruled all aspects of the justiciability of Sewell um, out? My, my immediate reaction is that it's, it's, it's a dead, it's dead so far as adjudication is concerned, and that's not the way forward. Um. Would you agree, Professor Tini? The, the court said <coughs> clearly that the policing of its scope and operation is not within the constitutional remit of the courts. That seemed to me entirely categorical. The courts would, were not prepared to get involved in enforcing Sewell. They were not even prepared to get involved, as, for example, the Canadian courts have, in defining the terms of the convention or the extent of the convention, never mind enforcing it. So it seems to me that the courts won't touch this. Thank you very much. Marie. Uh, thank you, convener. So can I ask you what you would fill that gap with in terms of constitutional um, consultation consent requirements? Well, we were talking about secondary law, lawmaking powers, which will, in this particular context, um, be conferred in some cases on UK ministers, some cases on Scottish ministers, in some cases, but we're not certain about this, so we won't know until we see the legislation uh, on both. There'll be concurrent powers that could be exercised by either. Uh, my concern is with the powers exercised by UK ministers, uh, either exclusively by UK ministers or concurrently with Scottish ministers in relation to not just devolved matters but reserved matters. Um, and what I would see the gap being filled by or what I would propose in relation to that is that there would be requirements of consultation with the Scottish ministers or in some cases obtaining the consent of the Scottish ministers to the exercise of those powers in the devolved areas. Um, and in some cases in the reserved areas, which I think would have the singular merit, 
of providing the element of bite, which is currently missing from our intergovernmental arrangements, whereby so much just depends on um, goodwill obligations which are in binding and honour only, and which can either by accident or by design be forgotten about. If, on the other hand, you're faced with a statutory requirement that says the Scottish Ministers must be consulted or their consent must be obtained, then you're talking about a completely different set of arrangements, um, a much more compelling set of arrangements, and that is what I would therefore propose. It seems to me that there's informal avenues or more formal avenues, and the informal avenue would be through intergovernmental relations and ways in which consent or agreement is sought through the sorts of channels that already exist. Um, however, it's also possible that absent the application of Sewell, <clears throat> the Great Repeal Bill um, could make provision or other legislation could make provision um, that would refer to the need for um, formal consent of both parliaments, or all the devolved parliaments and the UK parliament, for the making of legislation that crossed the boundaries between reserved and devolved matters. And there are provisions in the Scotland Act 1998 that already provide for that kind of joint consent. So that's more formal mechanisms, and those, those could be used. The practical difficulty is that we're talking about a vast body of legislation that's going to be, you know, we're talking about 12, 000, possibly 12,000 pieces of legislation that has been um, transposed from Europe into UK law. And a balance will have to be reached between um, arriving at the consent and agreement of the devolved territories and just getting this job done, because the, the Brexit job is going to be a massive one. And that's really where the balance is going to lie. Okay. Can I ask a, um, a further question? So, if I understand correctly, both of you think that the Sewell Convention should apply in this situation, but that it doesn't. So, and, that, yeah. and that there is a, a, we're kind of agreed that there is a gap, and that that gap should possibly be filled by an either informal or, info or formal requirements to consult and seek permission from the devolved parliament. Is that what, what you're saying? Uh, not, no? not quite. Uh, not, by <laughs> not by informal requirements. I'm all in favour of informal requirements and uh, people doing the right thing. What I'm worried about is when they forget about the, uh, you know, what they've undertaken to do. So you would you would that's that's why I want the degree of formality introduced. And, and that then takes you back to the deputy convener's question about the role of the courts. Then the co courts would have a role in relation to you know, have the statutory requirements been observed or have they not, uh, which from the point of view of the departments, and I'm talking now about Whitehall departments making this legislation, and I think it's important to recall we'll be, we'll be talking about a massively decentralised subordinate lawmaking process. Um, and it's at that level that you want people to be conscious of the need that this isn't just a matter for London, you actually need to talk to other people about it. And what you're saying is that there is something already in the Scotland Act 1998. Yes, there are models. Yeah. Cover that. Yeah, exactly. But you said that possibly it needs to be covered in the Great Repeal Bill itself. Well, no, I, I think that there are, what would happen is the Great Repeal Bill will provide the powers for the UK executive, and there will almost certainly be allusion to the executives of the devolved legislatures, but certainly of the UK um, executive, to, to make delegated powers to repeal a lot of EU law. The issue is, should it also um, make reference to the fact that when those delegated powers are used in areas that step into devolved areas, should at that point those powers, when they're used to repeal EU law, that also um, st step into de devolved areas, should at that point an allusion be made to Scotland Act Schedule 7 and say, when we're making delegated legislation in relation to powers that cross reserved and devolved boundaries, at that point, here are the mechanisms in the Scotland Act that we will use, or some analogy to those powers. Um, for example, um, jo joint consent of both legislatures would be needed to make delegated legislation in areas that, that step significantly into devolved areas. 
Okay, and whilst I understand your point about volume, you did also make the point that this is probably sets a precedent in terms of it, some of the, although there's a huge volume, some of it will be actually significant and not simply technical. Yeah. It, I mean, so it's does almost that, a... Does that require ex, you know, some sort of ex, exceptional mechanism? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> no, no, and you're, you're right. The, 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 the thing about European law is that we joined the EU, um, you know, over 40 years ago, and this vast body of law comes out of Brussels. The only practical way in which that law has been brought into UK law has been through delegated legislation. That doesn't mean that law is not important. It's just been a practical way of bringing it in through the, the European Communities Act. So we have a whole swathe of law that has been brought in through delegated legislation and which will be removed by delegated legislation. That, on its face, might, you know, if from an outside point of view, you might think, well, maybe it's not terribly significant. But we know the substance of that law often is terribly significant. So we ought not to be caught up by the form of the law. The fact that delegated powers will be used to remove this should not disguise us from the fact that often we are talking about very, very important areas of law that would, in any other context, be given full parliamentary treatment. Okay. Get into that a wee bit more in terms of the... Schedule 7 of the Scotland Act 1998, which Professor Page references in his very last paragraph uh, as a possible mechanism. What, what, what would the UK government require to do to en enact that sort of activity, and how long would it take to actually for it to, to achieve that? Because obviously, if we're on the brink of the Queen's speech this afternoon, and that gap exists, what would the UK government, you know, what would they you know, practically require to do to fill that gap, and how long could it take? Uh, they would need to do very, very little. Right. <laughs> it would just simply be that you know you would say that the exercise of this power you know will require you know it could be the consent of the Scottish ministers, or require the approval of you know it depends what parliamentary procedures govern the exercise of the powers, and all you're seeking and these and there will be provisions governing that in the legislation, and what you're seeking to do is ensure that these these extend to Scotland. And uh, it would be the work of five minutes for a drafter to oh, amend the, it. The, the, yeah. the, there are different mechanisms within. In the paper I, I've submitted, I, it's a, a paper I've been working on with Mark Elliott from Cambridge, and what we've been looking at are a distinction, perhaps, between in, in terms of designation. So when the, the devo these delegated powers are going to be used, um, it may be possible for the government to designate, well, this is simply a technical matter. This is a piece of secondary legislation that will simply remove the word European Union from this area of law because that's no longer going to apply. And that's the sort of thing that wouldn't, either wouldn't require the consent or could be done, for example, by negative resolution procedure and it could be covered fairly quickly. The other category would be for the government to designate um, or to make a statement to the effect that this piece of delegated legislation is going to cover a substantive area of law. And, uh, and, it's, and if it also designated that that substantive area of law stepped into devolved areas, then that would be the, where perhaps type A from Schedule 7 could be used, which would require affirmative consent of the devolved parliaments concerned. The practical problem, which I think the Chair is alluding to, is that these kinds of processes can take a very long time. We saw the Section 30 order. Um, and there is, as I say, this, this real struggle between this, what seems to be a, a fairly ideal system, and what could become a very, very complicated, long process of trying to make each piece of delegated legislation that would require consent around the UK that could take a very, very, very long time. Um, I don't have an answer to that conundrum. The process of actually getting the consent might take a long time, yes. but the process of en enacting the process to achieve that yeah. shouldn't, shouldn't be difficult. In the Great Repeal Bill, that wouldn't be difficult, but, but the danger is to put that in the bill, one would have to think what one was doing in terms of what the I'm implications sure. would that, that would mean for these 12,000 pieces of legislation yeah, sure that we're that. talking about. Yeah. But. Marie, sorry. Um, all I was going to say is can, uh, just a point of... In clarity, could we say UK government and Scottish government so I don't lose track? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know which government you're talking Sorry. about. <laughs> right, uh, Murdo. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Slightly, slightly different point, but a related one. Um, Professor Turney, in paragraph 8 of your paper, you make reference to the Supreme Court judgment in the, the Miller case, um, concluding that there's nothing to stop 
the UK Parliament passing the Great Repeal Bill without uh, consent from uh, the Scottish Parliament. But in your final sentence you say, the existence of the Sewell Convention, however, suggests that while it can do so legally, it is questionable whether or not it can do so constitutionally. Yes. Now, it's a long time since I sat in constitutional law lectures, but maybe you could explain in more detail the difference between these two concepts. Certainly. We, we clearly have law on the one hand, and if you break the law, the courts will enforce that law and say you can't do it, and that happens to the government all the time in judicial review and so on. We have political constraints. The government knows it's unwise to do certain things or they'll, be, they'll lose elections. So that's, and the Supreme Court tended in its judgment to, to, to treat those as the, the only two binaries that exist in our system. You either do something that's unlawful or you do something that's politically ill-advised. So it, it called the Sewell Convention a political constraint on the activity of the UK Parliament. To a constitutional lawyer, there is a third category in the middle, which is conventions, which is, as Professor Tomkins said, uh, a rule which controls behaviour, but which is not enforceable by the courts. It can be quite hard to understand, but there are, there are rules that political actors stick by because they know they, they are actually rules, they're bound by them, they're self-conscious that they're bound by those, even though they won't be enforced by the courts. Um, if you violate those constitutional conventions, the courts won't do anything. But my argument, is not simply my argument, is that you would be acting unconstitutionally. It might not be illegal, but it's more than simply politically ill-advised. You're doing something that is unconstitutional. Uh, in our system, we have a distinction between constitutionality and legality, but you can still act unconstitutionally without acting illegally. But who would determine if you were acting unconstitutionally? If you. The courts can't. You, political actors. Right. So, so in effect, it is, it is actually a political It's a political constraint, but what politicians who oppose what's happening can say, so if a minister does something clearly unacceptable and refuses to resign, uh, politicians react by that, to that by saying, this is completely unacceptable under the doctrine of ministerial responsibility. You were responsible for that department. You were extremely slack. You must go. There's a constitutional convention to that effect. I can't take you to court. The court won't remove the minister. <clears throat> but this is more than simply doing something ill-advised. This is, you have violated a convention of our constitution of, that you're responsible for your behaviour. So it's, it's not an, an easy line to draw. Uh, and it is, in a sense, all about impression and about the reaction of the political environment. But there is a distinction. OK, thank you. You could, yeah, you could, yeah, you could just say... The Sewell Convention is part of our constitutional arrangements. It applies in this particular case. If you choose to ignore it, you are acting unconstitutionally. As to the consequences of that, well, as Stephen said, that these are ultimately political, but nevertheless, the argument that you're acting unconstitutionally is, I think, very well grounded. I mean, the Convention has been there since day one, 1999. It's been um, sedulously observed. I'm not aware of any circumstances in which it's been ignored, or in the one case, if my memory serves me correctly, in which it was forgotten about, the legislation was immediately corrected to take account of it. Um, it's in with the constitutional bricks, uh, such as they are of our constitution. <laughs> yes. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, and what would happen in a case where legislative consent was unreasonably withheld? by the Scottish Parliament? Well, n oh, I see, unreasonably held by the Scottish oh, Parliament. Uh, <laughs> no, well, yeah. well, no, I think we understand it reasonably, but <laughs> yeah. the point I'm trying to make is, let's say, you know, the politics overrides the Constitution mm. and the Scottish Parliament were to decide it's going to make a political point by withholding legislative consent, what happens then? I mean, the, well, the Scotland yeah. Act is definitely clear what happens then. The UK Parliament can go ahead and legislate, and that's an end of the matter. I, w I wouldn't approach it in such um, um, confrontational terms. Um, you know, I would take a, a more step-by-step -step approach to it. Um, not talk about, you know, the threat of withholding consent is in the background, but what you're saying is, well, this is all very interesting, but we'd like to see the following things. Um, in other words, approaching it not just as a, uh, 
And that's why I talked about a Brexit legislative program uh, rather than the Great Repeal Bill. The focus is understandably on the Great Repeal Bill, but the bits that are going to be of real interest to the Scottish Parliament will come at a later stage. And it would be, in my view, therefore perfectly reasonable for the Parliament to say, well, this is all very interesting, but we need to see the full package before we can you know, come to a properly informed view on the question of consent uh, or not, rather than you know, it's our ball and we're taking it home. Um, yeah, so it may be unconstitutional for a, minister, uh, for a UK government not to seek the consent yeah. of the Scottish Parliament. Absolutely. But it wouldn't be unconstitutional for the Scottish Parliament reasonably or unreasonably to withhold that consent. Yeah. yeah. Just so, uh, and I realise we're dancing on the head of a pin a bit here, but these are, but could mm. be coming. Important issues, Patrick. Well, yes, just to just to expand on that. I mean, if if the word consent uh, is meaningful in this context, uh, rather than simply a rubber stamp, it has to be uh, a, a choice by the Scottish Parliament uh, to agree to something. So, surely, in in this situation where the Scottish Parliament has taken a view that politically it objects to a course of action uh, which uh, the the UK government acknowledges requires legislative consent. It's the UK government that would then be acting in this kind of grey, unconstitutional way uh, were they to legislate for something that the Scottish Parliament had not agreed to give consent for. That the constitutional course of action for them in that situation is to revise their plans and come forward with something that will gain the consent of the Scottish Parliament. And the question is, what sort of revisions you're looking for? Mm -hmm. you I suppose for me, you know, we, you're, you're suggesting a, an alternative menu of options uh, beyond the Sewell Convention uh, that, that might be drawn from. F for me, surely there's, a, there's, there's a, a, a question about does the UK Parliament or government have the, the authority to, to pick from that menu as it sees fit, or does the Scottish Parliament at least have the right to consent or not consent to the choice from that menu? What you're looking for is an agreement. It's as simple as that. Um, and, I, and I don't see an, an agreement, agreement willingly as, entered into. And I don't see an agreement as being unachievable around the sorts of things that we're talking about, which are basically procedural constraints saying, you know, the devolved legislature matters, the, the exercise of these powers in relation to Scotland is a serious business, we need to know what's being proposed, we need to be consulted in some cases, depending on how serious it is, we may need to consent. You're not talking about that in relation to the Great Repeal Bill itself, you're talking about all the stuff that will come down the line which uh, Stephen was talking about. Um, you know, the details of um, agriculture, fisheries, the environment, whatever you want to talk about. These are the areas where you want to be certain that the Scottish Government and Parliament's voice is being heard, but it matters to Scotland. One of the things about the Sewell Convention is, it's, as Alan has said, it <clears throat> it's actually worked very well. And I think you know a convention exists if it's the repeat pattern of behaviour. If, although it's not a law, people abide by it because they feel they're bound by it. Until it becomes a problem. <clears throat> but the two things can happen to a convention. <clears throat> One is that the nature of the con one is a convention can simply be found not to exist any longer. Mm -hmm. If political actors simply pay no heed to it, time after time after time, we can simply say descriptively the convention no longer exists. A second thing that can happen to a convention is that it's how we understand the limits of it change. So the, the nature of the Sewell Convention is that Westminster will not normally legislate um, with regard to devolved matters without consent. That word normally has never really been filled out. So to take Mr Fraser's example, for you know, if, if, if it were perceived that devolved legislatures were routinely putting unreasonable objections to legislation, uh, the, the UK might decide, well, when we perceive that there are unreasonable objections, we're no longer going to wait for sole consent. And then we could say, well, the sole convention has changed in that we no normally now means except you know, normally would, would mean one exception to normal would be unreasonable consent. So those are the, but that all depends upon behaviour over periods of time. Um, and then we as observers would look and say, oh, well, the convention now means this, the convention now means that. So this is actually a huge test case for so. You know, we're, we're now going to see just what the limits are, when it applies, when it doesn't apply. Um, technically, it doesn't apply to delegated legislation. We're now going to see if 
it, the, the principles underpinning it are now going to apply to delegated legislation. So it's, it's, it's it, because it's not written down, and no one's ever written it into a law. Well, apart from the Scotland Act, where it's referred to, um, but it's but it's not given force of law. I mean, it's what is recognised yeah. in the Scotland Act. Um, we're going to have to wait in practice to see how Brexit will let us fill in what Sewell means. William. Thank you, Convener. Just uh, a point of clarity, Professor Page, if you would, uh, just moving from that point. Uh, you, you said at paragraph 14 of your uh, submission that it is clear, and, and you've made this point very clearly this morning, I think, that the Scottish Parliament cannot, by withholding its consent, prevent the Great Repeal Bill or any other bill in the Brexit legislative programme from becoming law. Uh, but I was just slightly confused by uh, paragraph 2 of your paper, the, the final paragraph you say, the question of the Scottish Parliament's consent to the legislative consequences of Brexit has thus only been delayed. Uh, and I was just a bit unclear on what you meant by it being delayed, because to me it rather suggests the question could be asked again, uh, and the answer may change. Well, what I think I was referring to in paragraph two was, um, as I say at the beginning of that paragraph, much of the reaction to the Supreme Court's judgment uh, has been along the lines, this is not worth the paper it's written on, referring to Section 28 of the Scotland Act, and what I've tried to do is go behind that and say, well, actually, there's a lot more to it than um, you know that dismissive reaction, um, and uh, hence, it's still a live issue. It hasn't been disposed of by Miller, uh, and it remains to be determined. That's what I meant by delayed, not settled. So Miller didn't get rid of the Supreme. I'm referring actually here to the chair of the Scottish Affairs Select Committee and the um, Commons, who said to me in a question that uh, not worth the vellum it is written on. Uh, to which I replied, well, that's the sort of smart aleck comment that I think you would associate with a professor, which is why I talked about the paper it's written on rather than the vellum. So, yeah. I understand. Thanks for the clarity. Thank you. Willie. Thanks very much, Convener, uh, and I'll do my best to, to work my way through this. Uh, Professor Keating last week um, in his paper said, you know, if Westminster was to ignore Sewell and legislate in devolved fields, this Parliament could in turn legislate to nullify Westminster laws, leading to this endless game of legislation and counter-legislation. And he said this could only be ended by a specific reservation of the contested competence. Uh, but according to the larger interpretation of Sewell, such a reservation, altering the powers of the devolved body itself, would still itself require the consent of those legislators themselves. Do you agree with that? <laughs> Does that yeah, mean that? I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure I'm following what um, right. uh, Professor Keating said to you last week. I haven't read that. but. Um, but, um, yes, if, if, you, if at the end of the day you were talking about reservations, that is to say altering Schedule 5 to the, the Scotland Act, altering the, the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament, then unambiguously that would require the consent of the Scottish Parliament under the, under the Sewell Convention, unless it's done by an order under the Scotland Act, in which case you would require the consent of the Scottish Parliament. So, yes. Yeah. So, so, ultimately, if we go down this road of ping-pong and... Reversal. That is a starter at all. <clears throat> I think the point I try to make in the, the paper is that we can get bogged down in Sewell and what it means and the extent of it. But the crucial issue here is that, Bre regardless of what one thinks of the merits of Brexit, the actual process of bringing Brexit about is going to be an absolute headache to, to try and repeal all this law. The last thing the United Scotland and the United Kingdom needs is a war of attrition in the middle of that where the two legislatures are doing exactly the, the sort of thing you describe. And I think it, it's very dangerous if we take our eye off the ball by getting bogged down in Sewell uh, and ignore the fact that the really crucial issue here is intergovernmental relations and, as I put at the end of my paper, interparliamentary relations, so that there is a joined-up way of, of thinking about these issues. Because when the Great Bill Bill does take effect, the, the competences of the Scottish Parliament, as, as I think you're alluding to, will not change. The Scottish Parliament will have competence in those areas that are returning. And, there, and after the Scotland Act 2016, there are many new areas where, which clearly trait, um, where, where there are shared powers and a, a whole swathe of new areas. On top of that, you're going to have European competences. If one, if one wanted to be obstructive, 
it would be very possible for more than one legislature to be passing laws in exactly the same area to the intense detriment of the emergence of any kind of single market within the UK. So I, I think this is an issue that really calls for um, mature political agreement. I don't know how that would be reached, but the, 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 the nightmare scenario you're describing is a very real one and could happen in the absence of a, of a mature approach to intergovernmental relations. Okay. You mentioned the, the, the scale of the, the legislative challenge that, that we're facing. You know, is it likely there will need to be some sort of sifting process, you know, potentially involving both or all governments of, of the UK um, to you know, prioritise the level of scrutiny that will be required. And some, there has to be some sort of mechanism that allows that. So have you any suggestions how we could, we could go about that successfully? Um, Stephen, mentioned in, Stephen mentioned in his paper, Interparliamentary Relations, yeah. is the, which would, in, in this particular context, raise or highlight the possibility of joint scrutiny. Uh, between this parliament and the Westminster parliament, possibly with the other devolved parliaments. My understanding is that that's happened between the Welsh Assembly and Westminster. There have been um, joint meetings, but it's never happened between this parliament and, uh, and um, Westminster. That is one. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I, I suppose what I'm saying is the parliaments need to, in terms of scrutiny, but the parliaments need to get their acts together. Um, in terms of how best to go about that and how to do it most effectively. And I wouldn't rule out, I could see considerable merit and cooperation in, the, in that enterprise. And I, th I think uh, the initial s step would be to provide for designation of, of any piece of delegated legislation. And you, we already have this, we already have this, these kind of statements of the effect human rights or that they're, they're, they're the, the statements to the effect that they don't involve devolved matters and so on. So any power that's going to be used under the Great Repeal Bill, any piece of delegated legislation that's put forward, could be designated as either technical or substantive. And it could also be designated as reserved or potentially devolved or covering the, the boundary. And at that point, I think the, the resources at executive and parliamentary level are now so stretched that it, it makes sense to, to find mechanisms whereby some of that is maybe passed on to, to committees here to, to, to determine where the um, devolved component comes in and to try and, and divide up the sifting process to see which, which areas are devolved, which areas are not, and then to try and reach agreement about how this matter, how these, these provisions should be repealed or in many ways most likely uh, continued because a lot of this law will not actually be removed, it will simply be domesticated because a lot of it is law that we, we not, won't necessarily want to remove from the statute books. Um, so I think the Wales UK example, because they've, they've had to cooperate closely given the nature of Welsh devolution, which was always much more closely connected to Westminster than Scottish devolution, I think that could be a, an interesting precedent and, and uh, lessons I think could be drawn there for how the Scottish Parliament could start to talk um, with Westminster committees about dividing up the scrutiny role. Ash, I probably began, and I apologise, I, stray, I strayed into an area you, you were interested in, so forgive me, I just realised I've done that. I so, um, my question is in part covered, but just to pick up on what you were saying there, um, you know, you're asserting really that n not just as a way of preventing duplication, that the committees in, you know, the Scottish Parliament or the Welsh Parliament and the UK would maybe work together, but you're also making the point that this would be quite vital in sort of constraining the... Um, expansion and executive power, I think that's the way you put it in your paper. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yes. I mean, obviously, we are we're concentrating on the substance of Brexit. You know, we're leaving the European Union. It's a very dramatic process, and it's, and it's created a huge tensions in the territorial constitution. It's, it's inevitable that people have maybe taken their eye off the ball in regard to how that's been done and the way in which that's been done and arguably can only be done is by handing massive powers to the executive in effect to make law. Um, massive powers to the executive to change primary legislation by way of delegated legislation which is called Henry VIII powers. Um, that is a concern for any legislature. It's a concern for Westminster, the House of Lords Constitution Committee, I advise that committee, is always commenting on the danger of Henry VIII powers, so is the, the Delegated Powers Committee in the Lords and committees in this 
um, Parliament also are concerned with Henry VIII powers. So I think we have to be aware that it's not simply the UK government that's going to get those vast powers. The devolved executives inevitably will have to embark upon this process too. Um, and there is a job for parliamentarians, regardless of their view of Brexit or their view of the balance of power between Westminster and Holyrood, to keep their eye on the ball that their first duty as parliamentarians, or one of their first duties as parliamentarians, is to call the executive, wherever it may be, to account and make sure that whatever powers they have are subject to proper scrutiny. Do you have anything to add to that, Professor Page? No, I, I would agree entirely with what um, Stephen has just said. But go, going back to what was being said earlier about the possibilities of cooperation, I'm reminded just sitting here that there is an, actually a model, um, you know, I think it's called the Subsidiarity Protocol to the Lisbon Treaty, whereby, you know, this is where um, the EU. Um, because we're now talking about the opposite, but the EU legislates uh, in areas where um, the member states think they should legislate. You know, it's contrary to what is called the principle of subsidiarity, and there, there is provision there for parliamentary scrutiny. Parliament, in that context, being understood as the national parliament, that is to say the Westminster Parliament. But the arrangements, as I recall them, include provision for the devolved legislatures to tell the, U, the relevant UK Parliament committee when they have a particular issue in, to, in relation to a proposal. So that's, you would be talking about something uh, analogous to that, whereby the relevant Westminster Committee, which was scrutinising the exercise of these powers, was informed uh, about anxieties or concerns that the devolved legislatures might have in relation to their exercise, in relation to their particular competences. So there are, you know, there are models which one could easily build on uh, for that purpose. Okay, thank you. Can I just try and unpick some of the, the issues around that? And it links to Willie's and to Ash's question, because the repatriation of powers issue um, from the EU, they may or may not form part of the Great Repeal Bill, we don't know yet. But if the, if the white paper thrust was to be followed through that was presented before um, the election around pan-UK frameworks, etc. And they were to, if they were to be engaged as part of the Great Repeal Bill, do you think in these circumstances that that would engage Sewell? Um, because obviously if, they have going to have, if there is going to be some sort of pan-UK arrangement, you can't just leave the powers to come back to the Scottish Parliament, otherwise you'd have no way of exercising that pan-UK framework. So would Sue be engaged in these circumstances? Um, yeah, this, this is why I stress the programme rather than the Great Repeal Bill, because I don't see the Great Repeal Bill doing these things. I see it, so far as the devolved legislatures are concerned, as being about relieving them of the obligation to comply with EU law, uh, insofar as that ceases to be an obligation at the end of this process, and giving them the powers that we've been talking about. But when you get into the when you, when you get into the talking about frameworks and so on, what you're talking about is substantive policy areas such as agriculture, and well, the way in which the Great Repeal Bill White Paper chose to put it was to say that, um, you know, we, I think it's paragraph 4.4, .4, you know, we'll treat this as a, basically a fresh start. We'll convert the existing EU frameworks into UK frameworks using UK legislation, and then we'll talk to about, you know, how the powers should be distributed after that. The focal point of that will be Schedule 5, what is reserved and what is, you know, what is reserved, and the adjustment to that, all those powers. And I see that as not being an issue for the Great Repeal Bill. Politically, I think that's just taking on too much. I see that as the focus of the intensive discussions about things like co common frameworks and areas such as agriculture, and the adjustment um, of the reserve devolved boundary taking place in that specific context rather than being done in the Great Repeal Bill? At some stage, it may, if that was, it may require... 
legislation to amend the Scotland Act. Exactly, and that will that will require sewer consent. So it's not a one-off question. It's a question that's going to yeah. recur yeah. Um, throughout this process. But, but if you take Willie's question, then yeah. but Scottish ministers could decide to legislate in that area themselves. I'm not saying they're going to, but it's possible. They, and therefore, in, in that circumstance, who would adjudicate and who would have the primacy in that particular area? Well, <laughs> uh, this answer, this question came up a very long time ago, and the, the answer is whoever legislated last. <laughs> so it could go on forever. There is no answer. Short of um, removing the competence from the Scottish Parliament, so it no longer has power to legislate in that area, in theory it could go on forever. But, I, you know, I genuinely don't see that as a starter at all. Okay. I think it's important we don't get bo too bogged down in Sewell. I think Alan's absolutely right, and there's a perceptive point he makes in his paper that we could be looking at 10 or 15 bills. Eight, or, eight, yeah, according to the press this morning. There's, yeah. different, there's different numbers. So we could well be, and by Sewell, obviously, if it's primary legislation and it affects devolved matters, well, Sewell consent. Um, the danger if we get too bogged down in Sewell and say, well, Sewell applies if it's primary legislation, it doesn't apply if it's secondary. And the UK government thinks, well, we'll try and do everything through secondary legislation, which just creates, A, an accountability gap, and B, is simply going to antagonise the territorial dimension. So I think we, we, we need to put the technical limits of Sewell to one side and talk about the spirit of Sewell. And the spirit of Sewell is the fact that we have a territorial constitution. And the point of having a territorial constitution is to try and govern the state by consent. So people who look at other systems that are federal systems talk about countries that have competitive federalism or cooperative federalism. And there are ways in which you can manage those two routes to try and create a system that's much more cooperative rather than very competitive. Competitive would be the example Mr Coffey's putting forward where he who laughs last laughs loudest and you just keep antagonising. In a situation where we're trying to extricate ourselves from this massive body of law, which is complicated enough, to, to get into that sort of pathology of competition between two or four legislatures would be utterly disastrous. So I think the spirit of Sewell is calling for a mature approach among political actors to, to arrive at mechanisms to avoid this. If we're going to have these bills, they have to come forward on the basis of clear agreement about how that's going to impact on devolution, how um, um, the market in that area is going to work afterwards. It's fundamentally a task for, for IGR prior to the legislative process. Um, and I know I keep coming back to this point, but as a lawyer, I think it's very dangerous to get bogged down in the technicalities of who has the power to do this, who doesn't. We need to see the bigger picture which is, well, you may well have the power to do this and to legislate over each other's heads. In political terms, this would be an utter disaster. That comes into the area you were interested in, Liam, and in intergovernment relations in general as well. So. Uh, no, so I, I got my question earlier, and I was sorry. also going to ask Professor Tierney about the interparliamentary yeah, relations. Sorry, that's so. right. Thanks for that. So, you, so you're quite happy with that? I'm You've quite done that already. Thank you. Um, right, any other questions? Any other Ivan? Yeah, I'm just sitting taking notes and trying to get my head on all of this and it, it comes back to that issue around about, and again not being a lawyer, um, it comes back to this issue about you've got the legal and the uh, the political and then you've got the constitutional that's in the middle um, and you're saying if, as long as everybody's nice to each other that's, that's fine and we get that obviously. Um, and you get into specifics, sure, you can deal with specifics as they happen, but the fundamental issue here, or the point of contention here, isn't specifically going to be about we want to legislate to do this in, let's say, agriculture, because that's probably the one that's, or one of the ones that's going to be an issue. The UK wants to legislate to do something, and the Scottish Government wants to legislate to do something else, and we can sit there and reach a compromise. That's not, as I understand it, really going to be the issue. The issue is going to be... Um, the understanding of, of, of who's going to have the power to legislate, that's where we'll, we'll first hit the first problem, um, because the devolution settlement is obviously quite clear about what's reserved and what isn't. Um, and the Scottish Government take the view, perhaps, that the UK Government is uh, is encroaching on that, that territory. Um, so 
in that context, which is more abstract than a, we want to change a specific law on something to do with agriculture, it's much harder to reach a consensus because you don't have something that you can, you, you need to codify that and by virtue of where we are, that would require a change to the Scotland Act, I think, um, in terms of what's devolved and what isn't. And I think what you're saying is that because the courts aren't involved in this because of Miller, the backstop on this is the court of public opinion, which means that this stuff's going to play out in that political sphere, and that ultimately is where where any disputes, if you like, would get would get resolved. Is is that correct understanding of it? Well, I, I, I mean, to, to my mind, I mean, I, I've said the conventions are not enforceable by the court. Mm. That's that's clear. But it seems to me, and I mean, Alan may have a, a different view. It seems to me that the Great Repeal Bill in itself is not going to change the competence. Of the Scottish Parliament. So the matters that are still devolved to the Scottish Parliament will continue to be devolved there. Um, and were the UK government to use powers under the Great Repeal Bill to, to make regulations which it was felt were clearly in devolved areas, uh, the issue that, that could well be challengeable in the court, and we, we don't know how the court, because the, the powers of the Scottish Parliament are defensible in the courts, um, and, and then we would we would 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 the Great Repeal Bill have been sufficiently clear in its intention to give the UK government power that stepped into devolved areas? That could become a very complicated issue. Okay. Because you can't simply impliedly repeal the powers of the Scottish Parliament. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But it's. Um yeah, all I was going to say is um, you talked about the code of public opinion, but it's actually worth sticking with your agriculture ex example uh -huh. and thinking about, well, what does that mean? Uh, and what it means in practical terms is that at the moment the UK leaves the European Union, we will need an agricultural policy to replace the common agricultural policy. Um, and if I was a farmer, I would certainly want to know what that policy is going to look like. Sure. Yeah. Um, that's the practical question. And in UK terms, um, we are talking, or I assume we are talking about, a policy um, probably possibly drawn up, well, it could be drawn up by Westminster with the agreement of the devolved legislatures or done separately, but one which secures that the common frameworks that were raised in questions mm -hmm. earlier, but for the rest left the devolved administrations to, to go their own way or to tailor that UK-wide policy to their own circumstances. And it's worth remembering that under the common agricultural policy, um, the devolved administrations have very little discretion to tailor that policy. So the, the decisions are all taken in Brussels. Um, so that, you're talking about getting to that post-EU agricultural policy in the same way as you'll be talking about getting to a post-EU fisheries policy or yeah. environmental policy or whatever. And that, that's where the, the practical okay. decisions... So, so the solution to this is going to come, solution, but the resolution this will come at the point where everybody sat around the table exactly. trying to figure out what this yes, agricultural yeah. Yeah, policy that, that, looks that, like. So, so, so the, great, the Great Repeal Bill is the sort of prelude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's the but we're clearly a long, long way from that because I don't... No, no, that, that, that will happen very quickly, but... Uh, what well, I put another way, not much progress has been made towards that at, at this stage. Well, I, I'm surprised by In how terms, I don't think we know what the UK government's policy is. I, I'm even surprised on by how little progress appears to have been made or yeah. how little discussion there has been about the um, what is going to come next. Aye. All we know is it will be the subject of intensive discussions. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Patrick. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, f forgive me, I, I sort of got the feeling that I might have skipped a track there and uh, that Prof Professor Tierney's last answer uh, said that the repeal bill itself doesn't alter devolved competence, uh, but uh, Professor Page's written submission says that it does. I, I thought we'd already got to the point where there was acceptance that repealing the European Communities Act affects devolved competence, and therefore the, the issue of legislative consent is on the table. I think, yes, I think it and, is. And yet on. there was very little disagreement uh, from Professor yeah, no, Page no. after Professor Tierney's answer there. No, I don't think I, we were in disagreement. I think what, what, what it does, the Great Repeal Bill will remove the area of EU law that at the moment circumscribes what this Parliament can do. Yes. So this Parliament is stopped from legislating in a whole bunch of areas because of the EU. 
Mm -hmm. And the Scotland Act says that. You can't legislate contrary to that. That's suddenly all going to disappear. So suddenly the, the Scottish Parliament will, will be able to legislate in all those areas. Yes. We don't really know what the Great Repeal Bill will say about the Scottish Parliament's role. But my sense is it's not going to say very much. In which case, the, the, the competence that's written out in the Scotland Acts themselves will not be removed, will not be, will not be officially changed. There just will be a bigger area of law in which the Scottish Parliament can use those powers. It's not, it's not directly changed, but indirectly it's profoundly changed. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it will, by definition, it will no longer be constrained by the, yeah. by the restriction on legislating contrary to EU law. And it will be given additional powers. But if you, if you go back to my earlier analogy of a play of which the Great Repeal Bill is Act 1, it will change the Scottish Parliament's competence in the way that has just been described by uh, Pre Professor Tierney. Um, but it will be a sort of minimal change, if you like. And then there will be a whole series of other changes uh, in discrete policy areas, such as agriculture, fishery, and so on, which will be a matter for discussion and possibly agreement between the various parties involved uh, and the subject of subsequent legislation part of this programme. So it's not a one-off question. It's a you know, question, as I said earlier, that will recur time and time again, both in the Great Repeal Bill and in the other pieces of legislation that will follow. Well, we're going to find out pretty soon what the Great Repeal Bill has or does not have. And I think we're going to have to, and depending on what the context of that bill have and whether there will be a myriad of other legislation that will flow from it, we'll probably have to come back and talk to some more certainty because there's a bit of speculation going on at the moment because we can't be absolutely sure. So but in that context, we can I thank our witnesses for coming along today. I think it's been a very useful scene setter for us. Uh, it will certainly make our attention to the Great Repeal Bill um, this afternoon as part of the Queen's speech much more focused to actually see what's in it. So thank you very much. I, I, I suspend this meeting now till 11.30. Um, and, and thank you very much.
Um, the, well, the second item on today's agenda is to consider a Scottish statutory instrument relating to the land and buildings transaction tax additional dwelling supplement. Uh, before we come to the motion seeking our approval, agenda item three will take evidence on the order. We are joined for this item by the Cabinet Secretary of Finance and Constitution and Scottish Government officials John Sinclair from the Legal Directorate and Ewan, Ewan Cameron Nielsen, who is from the Fiscal Responsibility Division. I welcome our witnesses to the meeting and invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement, please. Thank you, Convener, and I'll aim to keep my opening remarks brief. An additional dwelling supplement liability arises where a buyer purchases an additional dwelling in Scotland and at the end of the effective date of that transaction, when mortgage funds are cleared and keys are handed over, the buyer owns uh, two or more dwellings and is not replacing their main dwelling. Replacing in the context of the additional dwelling supplement legislation means selling the previous main residence and buying a new main residence. For the purposes of the additional dwelling supplement legislation, the Scottish Government's policy is that a couple, and by which I mean a married couple, cohabitants and civil partners, is treated as one economic unit. This is to address the risk of properties moving be being moved between individuals for the purpose of tax avoidance. And it is also the Scottish Government's policy intention that where the additional dwelling supplement is paid, it can be reclaimed when a main dwelling is being replaced and the sale of the former main dwelling occurs within 18 months of the purchase of what becomes the current main dwelling. As the additional dwelling supplement has become embedded, it became clear that in practice the legislation has not been working as intended in relation to couples. Demonstrating that the Scottish Government is listening to taxpayers, the order before the committee this morning amends the legislation to address this for cases going forward, and it does so in two respects. First, the order amends the current legislation to provide relief from additional dwelling second homes tax, where couples jointly buy a dwelling house, that, but the dwelling house being replaced is owned by only one of them. And the second legislative amendment provides for the scenario where the transaction for disposal of the former main dwelling owned by one of the couple is concluded after the transaction for the joint acquisition of the new main dwelling. In short, this amendment will allow for a repayment of tax paid to the couple if the disposal happens within 18 months of the joint purchase of the new main dwelling. And Convener, I'm happy to take any questions that members may have. Uh, okay, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I know that Murdo Fraser certainly has some questions. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, you all know, because we have corresponded about it, I have a, uh, constituents who are affected. Uh, I'm sure there are other members uh, in the Chamber who have similarly brought concerns to you. Um, can I firstly just warmly welcome the fact that this instrument is being brought forward, and thank you for, for doing that. I know my constituents will be pleased to see this unintended consequence of the legislation uh, being addressed. Um, I wonder if you have any sense of how many uh, individuals or family units in Scotland will have been affected by this in the period since the additional dwelling supplement was, was introduced? It's very difficult to quantify. In fact, I can't quantify because the way that uh, tax uh, returns are completed in LBTT, it, it doesn't ask for the specific information that answers that question. Um, so. I don't know, but there's no evidence, there's nothing to suggest that it's a large number of people who quantify it uh, large. But what we'll be able to do is Revenue Scotland will work um, subject to the committee in the Parliament approving the order to engage with people to make them aware of that. And then the next point, which relates to uh, Mr Fraser's um, constituents, is this doesn't resolve it retrospectively. That will require a further legislative uh, mechanism uh, that I'm exploring. And that should also, um, if that is uh, successful, would allow Revenue Scotland to engage w with all those, essentially, that have paid the tax. So that should capture anyone that's affected by this issue. Yeah, there's, thank you. I'm just going to come on to that question of, of, of the um, retrospective um, re remedy, because I appreciate this instrument won't, won't solve that particular problem. Um, uh, my own constituents are, have, of course, already had to pay that money. And I'm wondering if, while you're looking for a, a legislative vehicle to try and deal with the retrospective issue, I I is it at all possible, for example, to issue guidance to Revenue Scotland to um, advise them how to address this issue where where, where you have people caught in the retrospective trap pending legislation being brought forward, or is that, is that simply not able to be done? It, retrospectively, it, for, for, well, 
going forward, Revenue Scotland will apply what Parliament approves. Um, they will have to continue to apply to the strict letter of the law what's currently in place. <clears throat> but certainly if the law is changed, then of course they would apply that and look to uh, resolve this in light of any legislation that may be passed. Um, I should point out, and it's absolutely not for me to advise uh, solicitors how to do their job, but of course they can give appropriate, uh, relevant uh, advice at the point of advising their clients, and I'm sure many have done so. Okay, do you want to expand on what you mean not, by that? Not particularly. <laughs> um, I, 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 I wouldn't want to advise people how to engage in any form of tax avoidance, but let's just say different solicitors may have given a uh, uh, different advice as to how to approach this subject. What we are doing is uh, delivering on essentially the policy in intent uh, that I've uh, outlined. Any other questions? Patrick. Uh, thanks very much. Um, the, the policy intention of the government is still to treat couples in one way and people who perhaps have a joint mortgage because it's the only way that they can afford to, uh, to buy a property to live in as their main residence. Uh, if, if they're not a couple, they're treated in a different way. Is, uh, am I right in saying that there's no intention to look at that kind of situation uh, and to address uh, something which might be becoming a, a, a more common uh, arrangement? Yeah, it's true to say that I'm looking at a very specific mechanism to uh, address what has been identified and not that wider point. So it is looking at uh, couples as one economic unit for the reason that's been given. And, and what, is the, what is the reason for treating as an economic unit only couples and not, uh, for example, uh, two or more friends who, who have a joint mortgage together because that's the, the affordable way for them to meet their housing needs? Well, I haven't, I haven't had that raised with me previously. I haven't given that full consideration. This is about uh, a couple as an economic uh, unit, about minimising uh, tax avoidance and uh, ensuring that degree of fairness. I'm happy to hear more evidence from Mr Harvey, but I'm very clear this is a very specific, uh, in essence, anomaly coming from uh, the interpretation of the legislation that I want to address in light of the communication that I've received. So the government might be open to looking at that in the future? I don't want to trigger a, a much wider debate on what I'm trying to resolve here. I want to be very clear and very focused on the remedy that I'm proposing today and returning to the issue to address it retrospectively. But if Mr Harvey wants to raise that issue with me, I'll happily engage. Okay. Uh, but this is very specific uh, about uh, this issue that has been raised with us. Uh, raised with us by the Law Society and uh, a number of uh, MSPs, but I'm happy to respond very um, swiftly to the correspondence that I have received to resolve this. Okay. I'll have a further discussion with Mr Harvey if that's helpful. Thank you. Liam. Thank you, uh, just a point of clarity, if, if you would, please. Uh, so this is about uh, a policy intention that, for whatever reason, wasn't actioned correctly, uh, and so there is a group of people out there who have, been, who have paid tax in good faith uh, but shouldn't have. Uh, so presumably, assuming this goes through, uh, a considerable amount of resource needs to be devoted to identifying those people and making sure that they are refunded the tax that they shouldn't have paid. Is that correct? Yes, Revenue Scotland will undertake that work, yes. Right. Uh, and, and they will presumably, uh, that will be given a due level of importance to make sure that people who've overpaid inadvertently are recompensed. That's correct. Thank you. No other questions? In which case, we now move to agenda item three, which is consideration of the motion on the order. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move motion S5M05994 that the Finance and Constitution Committee recommends that the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Bracket Additional Amount Second Homes Main Residence Relief Bracket Bracket Scotland Bracket Order 2017 Draft be approved. I move. And I put the question. The question is that motion S5M05994 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The committee's agreed. Uh, the, cabinet Secretary, the, the committee will publish a short report to the Parliament setting out our decision on that order. That's the last piece of business on our agenda for today. Next meeting will be the last meeting of the committee before the summer recess, and we'll be taking evidence from the Minister for Negotiations in Scotland's place in Europe on issues to do with Brexit. So I now close this meeting.
of the committee. Thank you very much.